You've heard of Where's Waldo? Where's Scully? You just have to know where to look. Wrong. So I guess I have created more work for myself. Broke one of my most cardinal rules, and that is, is that when you're trying to make something better, don't make it worse in the process. Let's work the problem, people. My buddy, Ed Harris. You see that? All right, that's supposed to be in the other studio, but it ain't. Yours truly discovered a problem with the power supply. <sighs> Fooses, okay? You notice this one here is loose because what happened was is that the actual housing for this that's supposed to hold on to little tabs on here inside a fuse holder. But I also noticed something else. This uh, part right here that's supposed to be making contact with the topmost part of that fuse is actually coming out of the actual fuse holder. So I'm gonna have to replace that. But here's the rub. If that one is old enough and the Bakelite is breaking, then chances are these are the same age because they were all born at the same time. So we're just going to go ahead and shotgun the whole thing. Okay. This is the fuse that's supposed to be in that holder. That's a one amp fuse. I know because I checked it. This is labeled three amps bus AGC three. So this is a three amp fuse. So, and this is supposed to be a three amp, but oh, look at this. This is a slow blow. And it occurs to me that perhaps we should discuss fast blow versus slow blow. Fast blow fuses are going to be used in a power supply circuit that is going to not have a, a good deal of inrush current. And I'm looking at this here, 35 volts positive, negative 35 volts. So it doesn't surprise me that there is a fast blow in those capacities, okay? This is of course labeled line, three amps. So this is no doubt, even without looking at the schematic, this is actually going to be a fuse for the power input to the power supply. So this is going to end up having, you know, 120 volts on it. We're going to go ahead and change those out. I can do that by virtue of Amazon. They are really, really tight. Not going to go there. Let's see how we can get this thing unbuttoned. I just, I really want to get this working and get that Scully back in that rack because it's a beautiful machine. And right now there is just this big empty, just a great deal of big emptiness in Studio 7. Where we're at is right in here is all the wires that are going to be going to these various fuse holders. So we we'll do one at a time. That way I don't get any of the wires confused. In fact, this middle fuse holder right here is actually got two wires on that particular one. Now I'm going to start with the broken one first because it pissed me off. All right. That's all I'm going to say about that. But I was not happy. Snip dangle and snip dangle. It's a technical term because of the nature of that nut. Not the one on the screen. I'm gonna need my needle nose, not the long nose. Just get it loose and then we can spin it. I'm sort of curious looking at this thing because oftentimes these fuse holders has got a flat spot on there, which allows you to then when you get this and you slide it into the hole and you go to put the nut on there, it won't spin on you. So it actually sort of holds on to it while you're trying to get the nut down on top of that thing. Okay, so the wires are cut, which is fine. So I'm just gonna sort of break this loose because you almost have to, it's been in there for like 60 years. Now, two schools of thought, okay? Yeah, this washer on this fuse holder is old. Do I really wanna put it back on there? It's kind of a rubberized plastic. It's still pliable. If I can manage to keep as many parts to this thing original, then that's kind of the way I want to go. But as I sit here, I'm thinking, you know what? I've got a new one. I'm just going to go ahead with the new one. There isn't a purist out there who's going to say, uh, you know, I don't really give a diddly damn about whether or not the washer was original or not. We'll just put that one with that fuse holder. There's that flat spot that I was talking about right up top there. And with a new fuse holder, 
and then the, you can feel where the threads are not. So that's gonna go in there like that. And what happens now is, is that fuse holder is not gonna wanna turn. That just helps with twisting that cap off to replace the fuse and twisting it back and stuff like that. If that wasn't really helped to not be twistable, what might happen is, is that if you could continue to rotate this thing in place, these wires back here are gonna get all tangled up and possibly short. Now, in the case of a fuse, all right, it's not a big deal. If they short out together, then your stuff's still going to work. But what'll happen is that the fuse won't blow. And if the fuse won't blow, then what ends up happening is, is that all of the electronics that are having a problem that should blow the fuse, they ain't gonna, they're not gonna survive. And what ends up happening is, and this is just another one of those rules that I try to live by, okay? All of these components here, the way these things are manufactured, they're full of smoke. They put the smoke in there and that's what makes them work. When you let the smoke out, they don't work anymore. I'm gonna put the new washer on there. There is no lock washer with this particular assembly, so this is supposed to be the only thing that's gonna hold that on. But I've got this lock washer, which I'm gonna go ahead and use that. So now that's on there, I'm gonna run this nut down on top of that and get this thing all immobilized. And I have to figure this out on my own because this fuse holder came brand new without a installation manual. That's nice and snug. Now, next thing is we got to attach the wires. And remember when I said I had enough slack? Well, it's gonna be tight now because this tab over here is not on this side. And consequently, it would have been on the same side, but th there's enough here to work with. What I like to do is probably just get about an eighth of an inch and I just squeeze just enough till I get past the insulation on the outside and then just sort of tug that off with my thumb. All right, we'll do this other one just like the same way, okay? I'm gonna tin these leads, slightly older wire. It's got a different smell when it gets hot. I just love that smell. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna take the longer wire to go the longer distance. Just wanna do this and bend that around that tab so that way the stress is going to be on the lug and not just on the solder joint. I've already tinned the lead, so I'm just gonna start tinning the lug itself, get it started. I'm gonna take this wire and I'm gonna just melt it onto that lug and pull it tight. Let it cool and I'll wait for it. I'm gonna go ahead and trim this, but I wanna get my hand down in here and make sure that the part that I'm cutting off not going to live inside this box because this box is gonna be flipped around and stuff like that and creating yet another repair. This lug, this lug on the side of this next fuse holder is on that side. So I'm wondering if the flat side of the fuse holder is actually gonna be on the bottom because it was on top over here and the lug was here. Let's find out. These wires are older. So consequently, you really, you know, don't wanna stress. Yeah, I'm gonna be a little bit gun shy. So here's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, I cut that red wire off, but I'm gonna go ahead and just desolder the two wires on that other lug and see where the flat side, uh, see where the flat side is. Breaking that loose, okay. This fuse holder has a flat side here and on this side. So this one could have gone in either way, which is interesting. But the new fuse holder, I think it's only flat on one side. This fuse holder has only got the flat side on one side which means that this one's only gonna go on and go in one way. And that's going to put the side tab on the same side as the other one. It's getting a little hard to get my fat fingers down inside there. So I'm gonna use the proper tool. I'll show you something. Okay, so if you're looking at this washer, it's got this little oblong part on here. Well, you know, they're trying to help you out. The manufacturers are trying to think of everything. All right, see that side tab? When you go to put this on there, if you take that little oblong cutout right there and simply slip that over the side tab, that's what it's for. And yet it still will thread on there just, just fine. So that, that's why it's on there. So, you know, even the metal nuts that are coming off of the old fuse holders, because I showed you the, you know, the new ones that are nylon, okay, but they still have that notch in there. But look here, the old metal nut has got that out there. So it could fit over that side lug. Put this back in there, flat side, which is going to prevent that from rotating. We get a washer on there, trim that excess wire off of there, grip it with the needle nose, cut it off, toss. Red wire, okay, done. All right, 
fuse holder number two. I mean, I like the way these, these cables are dressed in this harness, you know, where it kind of basically comes down to the circuit board here, it comes down here to these fuses and so forth. So, I mean, it's dressed out real nice. I, I like to keep it that way. And this one has a gray wire. Whoa, look at that. Okay, so coming right off of this pin right there, which is gonna be the hot leg of that outlet, gray wire comes right up here to that fuse, okay? The blue with the black tracer comes off of that and disappears. There's a flat spot right up there. I'm just gonna set this in place. And what's the first thing we're gonna do? Put the washers on. Kind of have to be careful too, because you know, these old fuse holders, these are plastic, okay? These fuse holders here, they're Bakelite. And using a metal nut on the Bakelite, you gotta, if you get it too tight and it'll, it'll either crack the Bakelite or it'll strip the threads. Cause you know, metal on plastic, bad idea. Metal on Bakelite, not much better idea. No. But if I put the gray wire on there now and then go after the blue wire and try to solder that one on, the gray wire may be in my way. And I may damage that wire with a solder iron if I try to do the blue after the gray. So we're gonna do the blue first, then the gray. Also, I might mention that good idea to not have the fuses in place. For the most part, a fast blow fuse is just this teeny little filament that's inside there. This slow blow fuse has a spring and a little dollop of solder with a wire attached to the cap on this end. What will happen is as current is flowing through that, it will warm up the solder just a little bit and then the tension on that spring will snatch that and actually break the circuit, okay? Well, of course it's solder or some form of very malleable piece of metal. And what'll happen is, is that if you're soldering on this thing and the heat is transferred with the fuse in place, you could damage the fuse. You gotta be careful too, when you're reaching down inside there with a finger, with one of your fingers or somebody else's fingers in there and you wanna get in there with the side cutters and actually trim that off, you wanna be real careful how you go about that, okay? Because it can get ugly real fast. Fuses, yeah, three new fuse holders and I actually had the fuses. Uh, I'm gonna do a little magic right here, which is a camera for, all right? We're gonna zoom out. Picture's gonna get bigger, just like that. Yeah, all right. And right up here are the three fuses. And I actually have one, two, three. Top, or bottom, middle, top. Bottom, middle, top. I actually did it that way on purpose. I don't have to necessarily remember where they went, but I'm checking anyway. You don't wanna force it when you're putting it back together. But these, the fuse is actually gonna push into the cap. I'll do that again, okay? Right there, it's just, it's just being held at, the, at a little bit, but push it all the way into the cap because what happens is, is that the bottom part of this fuse holder, if the fuse is not pushed all the way into the cap and it's just hanging on the outside like that, when you go to put this in, it's going to push, put too much pressure on the spring mechanism inside that fuse holder. So make sure that this is bottomed out, okay? And then just set it in there and I'm rotating it so that it'll line up. Now watch what happens when I close this fuse. When I put this fuse all the way down to the fuse holder, this is going to actually come out the bottom because it's spring loaded. This fuse doesn't want to go into this fuse holder. See, there's, there's, there's extra bands of metal in there that are going to basically hold that fuse in place. You kind of have to just be gentle, but firm. And that will work, okay? So I'm pushing that in, rotating it, it's in place. This puppy's ready to go. At this point, I really think what we'll do is we're just gonna go ahead and mount this back to the chassis and pat ourselves on the back. Welcome to Studio 7. This is where we open and close our episodes. And so you've probably seen some of the items that I have in this particular studio. Well, somebody wrote to me and said, is that machine behind you, that's a Scully. I said, yeah, it's a 280B. He says, is it working? And I said, well, yes and no. Because what happened was is that in order to run this machine into my prosumer equipment, I needed to get an interface that would convert the balance to unbalance and so forth. So I'm pulling cables through here and the cuff of my sleeve hung across that fuse holder and snapped the cap off because the bake light was so old. And that's what we, you know, ended up fixing. Well, now we're gonna get to demonstrate. And I'd like to mention 
you know, how I actually acquired this machine. And I really had little to do with it because this was a gift. My son had listened to my stories for years about, you know, my days in radio and being an engineer and there was a disc jockey and a station manager. Well, <clears throat> what it really comes down to is, is that he listened to all those stories for all those years and one of the radio stations I was at had a pair of 270s. And, you know, they used them for their FM automation. They all had some ITC machines as well. Well, <clears throat> I always thought that it'd be so cool to own one of these because it'll play 14 inch reels. And I have an entire library, probably a couple hundred of these 14 inch reels with all this classical music and all that vinyl that was recorded on there is out of print. And I had a I wanted to be able to listen to these tapes. And I thought, well, the only way to do that would be to have a Scully. Now, little teaser, okay, was never gonna be able to afford a Scully. So I built what I call a Merlin. And we'll talk about that in future episodes. He's listened to those stories for years and he managed to find a guy in Canada who was going to be working on one of these. And what this guy did was he basically realigned this entire RP unit up here, replaced a couple of heads, and it plays great. And one of these days we're gonna test the recording of it too. But what we've got here is just a piece of music. I've decided that at this point, I just wanna be able to enjoy it. 